All right, hey everybody. I am going to give a hopefully brief, no, it's going to be brief. <laughs> We're in class. A brief synopsis on the book, um, The Color of Law. And so I wrote this down because I am overwhelmed <laughs> Woo, with all the information that was in this book. So I'm going to try to read from a script so I don't get off key or just go too long and get on a tangent and don't get off at the expense of you watching this video in class. All right, so I am completely overwhelmed by this book and I will try to do it justice in this small allotted time. So the book covers de jure segregation versus de facto segregation. In law and government, de jure segregation describes practices that are legally recognized regardless whether the practice exists in reality. In contrast, de facto segregation describes situations that exist in reality, even if not legally recognized. And so um, that's we we talked about this last time a little bit with Dr. Hefner when she was with us. So I wanted to point out some key um, talking points, shockers, uh, my takeaways from this book. And so it's language. The author uses the word ghetto to mean exactly what it is. Ghetto is was defined as a quarter of a city with in which Jews were formerly required to live. But now it, it has evolved to a place where black and brown people are required to live. So it's the, the thing is, it's a requirement. The ghettos were required places uh, for Jews. Now, based on these laws that this book goes through, it was a required place um, based on the policies that an ordinance that was put into place for black people specifically to live. The most powerful thing about this book is that um, it was a requirement that refutes the de facto myth um, that birds that birds of a feather flock together. That's what de facto says. Um, it was more than just birds flocking together. Birds would rather herd it together in order to keep them all in the same place. And so another interesting point with the use of language was that how we use adjectives to, to, to describe different people. When we think about um, who's rioting, if it's um, black people or brown people, we use words like thugs. Look at those thugs. Um, 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 when it comes to those type of people, um, but when white people riot or destroy property, we don't use those words. Those words, those thugs, those white thugs, different things like that are rarely used. Um, Rothstein, Rothstein, um, Rothstein, I should have practiced saying his name, says when whites gentrify an area, we don't call them the inner city youth. When they gentrify an area, area here's my quotes, we don't call them the inner city youth. Um, when they move all the brown people out or the low income people and we don't call them inner city youth. We call them people or we call them um, the city, but we don't call them inner city youth. We use that colloquialism for black and brown people when they live within the city. Um, the first chapter and I, I'm, I'll say this, the first chapter starts off says is um, if San Francisco, then everywhere. Um, it just basically breaks down um, what happened in San Francisco, which happened pretty much everywhere in all major uh, metropolitan cities. Um, so ordinances, I'm just going to go through the list of things that I just just pointed out. Ordinances, uh, ordinances were passed um, such that apartments were not allowed to order um, in order to keep blacks from moving into the community i think i read that wrong but anyway they were not allowed to build apartments because when they said that blacks would be uh, attracted to apartments so uh, ordinances were passed so that um, apartments could not be built in that particular area all right so when public housing was built for vets in one city 20, 21 disqualifying factors were used such as um these were the factors irregular employment disqualified you single parent families and out of wedlock birth criminal records narcotic addiction um poorly behaved children Poor, poor housekeeping, the lack of sufficient furniture, couples um, had to show their marriage licenses in order to buy a place or rent a place for public housing. Even the, the thought of public housing, what we see it as now, it really did not start that way. Many times it was used to um, house vets and, and it was built for um, uh, middle income families. Um, so when we look, about, look at public housing now, it did not start that way. So that was even interesting. Um, when uh, whites would riot in Detroit to keep blacks from moving into the community, that's how much more, how much they didn't want them there. Uh, following the Supreme Court uh, 
decision of separate but equal, Birchman Fitzpatrick, general counsel of the Housing and Home Finances Agency, said this did not apply to housing. I mean, flat out said that. Um, in Chicago, it wasn't until 1998 that blacks were offered vouchers that whites were offered when they needed public housing. Too late to reverse the effects of what had already been established by law. And I think that's important to understand that these were laws. These were these were things written in law. And the government did nothing to um, uh, break down these laws or um, dismantle these laws. People would soothe cities and even have the FBI into a case to see if a white man had intentionally bought a home to rent out to a black man. Y'all the FBI involved in figuring out if this white man <laughs> intentionally bought a house to rent out to a black man. They got the FBI involved. Um, again, um, a term used in the book called blockbusting consist, consisted of hiring black women to walk. And we're talking about white flight, white flight here. This is the white flight chapter of hiring black women to walk around in carriages, having black men drive around blasting music, um, having black men knock on doors to see if the homes were for sale just so that developers could buy properties cheaper. Because once the white people moved out, it's like, I got to get out. I got to get out. Um, and uh, so they can buy the properties cheaper so that they can have black people move in and raise the cost and the rates and sell them to high percentages okay anytime developers tried to do any mixing of races in the area they um, were blocked by um, state and government funds and local funds and city funds um, standards and ordinances would change from residential to industrial or the square footage of homes and properties would increase to keep black people from buying them so if you increase the size the the amount will go up and we know that um, working class black people will not be able to buy them so we we're going, to, we're going to change this area from resident, residential to industrial because we don't want any mixture of race. Blacks were kept in roles that limited their financial advancement, therefore keeping them segregated to one area. Listen, I can go on and on about the different things that occurred to keep blacks in the ghettos. Dr. Hefner asked me to re, uh, relate this knowledge to my work as a teacher. But before I do that, I want to share an analogy to um, better help everyone see because it really opened my eyes in another way you know you, you hear stuff over and all and i don't want people it can become so common for people to talk about inequity that we just get so um uh what it becomes watered down like it just this that's the word that's the corn phrase that we just uh okay that's i'm getting on a uh yeah all right so stay to the script mr o'neill um a woman um by the name of cherry shared this analogy with me in a leadership group she said say for instance you were playing monopoly and you've been playing for three hours you now invite a new player in to say hey you can play so you get your 200 dollars you get all the things that you do that you get that everybody started off with but you all been playing for three hours how much success will that person coming in three hours later really have? Yeah, you, you've given them the tools, but you didn't give them the opportunity to start when everybody else has started. And so that three hours can be 300 years. You can look at it however you want to. But yes, some people, some people um, based on luck or, or prayer or whatever you may believe may actually rise to that occasion where they actually may start only. They may own a property. But what is the likelihood of someone coming in three hours later to a Monopoly game and you know there's penalties when you land on different houses and different things well i own that so you got to pay that you know what's the reality of that person being successful in the game and so when she said that it just opened my eyes i just want to share that so i say that to say this our black and brown kids have been systematically disadvantaged by a system that was put in place to keep them disadvantaged it was put in place it was it was it was nurtured and um it was supported by law um, in some cases, it wasn't until, like I said, 1998 that some states, districts, municipalities came in compliance um, with the laws that were passed um, several years ago, let alone the, past, the laws that were outlawed in the practice. Black people were su supposed to have nothing. I think that's powerful to know. Um, as a black and brown person, I was empowered to have nothing. 
in power to have nothing. Um, that's the reality. And I personally have never been an advocate for reparations and know that this word, um, that this will never happen. Even the, the author alludes to different things that we could do um, that in the climate that we live in would never happen. But I think people think um, because folks are not outright calling black people the N-word anymore on TV that um, they're not still treating us like an N-word. Um, a policy calls me an N-word every day. If you put a policy in place that limits my advancement and opportunity, you've basically called me the N-word without saying it. Um, so my response as an educator is to leverage the field by teaching students not only uh, math, but skills that will hopefully translate into the world and they find an advocate. Listen, every white teacher, which is... Um, White teachers, white female teachers make up 76% of the teaching population is made up of, well, I just read that wrong, but white white female teachers make up 76% of the teaching population. Um, we, You have the ability to be an advocate. Whether we teach black or brown kids, your white kids, our white kids need to know about the sins of their forefathers and even the sins of their fathers right now so they have a conscious chance of saying no to a system or participating in what's inherently passed down. Um, if people don't know what's there, sometimes they don't know what they're participating in. We have to be an advocate, whether we teach a black person, a brown person, um, whether they're white or not. This is the history of this country. This is where you're at. So teach the history. Even the author alludes to the books, <laughs> these popular books that talks about, you know, um, our history books that don't mention anything about what, what, how black people ended up in the ghettos. How? Want to tell us how? I mean, this is, this is a... Uh, a, a history class. I'm supposed to be learning the history. You know, the books don't even tell tell this story, and and so and 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 it gives a supremacy. It supports a supremacy of of white people that they may not even know they have, and it supports a um a, a downward look um on black people that I might not know I have. I have um encountered different things that I feel about myself because of a system that that I was invited into play in. Um and so um I'm as a black male I make up 2% of the teaching population and I have never been more empowered by the knowledge that has given me in this book, but knowledge is not enough. I I'm so glad that somebody is saying that. It's not enough. I need advocates with power and there are usually white men. That's the reality. And so um, as an educator, I realize that I'm, I, it hurts. You know, when we wonder why our, our black and brown um, schools, the inner city schools are so rough, it, they were built to be rough. And it is so hard for teachers to stay there because you're not just you're not encouraging one child. You are going up against a system and a, a system that needs to be dismantled. And sometimes I remember saying this and I'm getting off because, oh, my God, it's 12 minutes, almost 13 minutes. But um. I remember saying, um, someone telling me that it was a counselor, like when I worked in those areas, she was like, sometimes you, it takes years for you to see the fruit um, of that manifestation and, and of a child that, that, that grows up out of that system. The, the payment that comes back to you or the thank you that comes back maybe years from, from, from now. That's hard. That's a hard life to live in. And so these systems are built to keep people marginalized. And as an educator, my response is to tell the history, tell it to every race, um, and to give my black and brown students a fighting chance as much as I can when I step into a classroom to not only empower them with the knowledge that I have, but empower them with the resilience that I have. Because when I stand in front of them, and I'm just speaking personally for myself, when I stand in front of a child, there is a likelihood they have never seen someone like me stand before them. And so when my black and brown boys see that, I want them to realize that you can stand in front of somebody uh, as well. And so I'm done. Um, yeah, I'm gone. And so that's what I learned from the color of law. All right. Bye.